Hi, and welcome to another episode of Hot Takes with me, The Silver Fox. Uh, this is a very different kind of video. Uh, in fact, it's the first of her hopefully six videos all relating to the ferry debacle in Scotland. Uh, we had a contact come to the channel, contacted us, uh, presented us with an absolute plethora of uh, evidence, of knowledge, uh, of all sorts of background information. Um, it was quite stunning and we decided that we would do this uh, in a documentary format. So instead of me looking at the news events of the day and doing my personal reaction to them, we are presenting them, uh, in a, like I say, in a documentary style. It's going to be evidence-based, truth-based, uh, no hyperbole. I am not thinking for you. Uh, I'm simply presenting information uh, and it is going to be up to you to draw your own conclusions. We are not guiding you in any way. Uh, it's going to be a sort of a flat delivery rather than me, um, you know, being very emotional about things. That's not what this is. Um, so this is the first of the six. Uh, each video will be around the 10 minutes mark. This one will be slightly longer because simply of this introduction. Most of them will be around the 10 minutes mark, uh, like I say. And it's going to be um, a series of short videos, each uh, covering a different topic on the, uh, the debacle. Uh, we're going to start here with the introduction. Uh, it's simply sort of a very, very brief history of the ferries followed by an introduction of the uh, various organisations involved at all the stages. Um, some of the key players will be uh, introduced and then we'll do a very brief stint on how the whole thing was supposed to be funded. So uh, I thank you very much for watching. I hope over the course of these six videos you find them entertaining, but more importantly, informative and educational. Uh, and so uh, without any further ado, we shall get into the beginning of this video which we are calling the introduction because it's introducing all the people here goes scotland has an immense coastline in fact it's one of the largest coastlines of any country in the world this is in part due to the fact that it's got between five and six thousand individual islands many of them particularly the larger ones are inhabited and these inhabited islands have, for virtually the entire history of Scotland, only been accessible by sea. There have, of course, been several bridges built onto some of the islands that are particularly close to the mainland. This one, for example, is at the Kyle of Lacalche onto the Isle of Skye. But for most of these islands, the ferries are still the only method of getting to and from the mainland and to bring supplies to the islands. And of course we've had ferries for many many years here is an example of a ferry from the 50s and then one from the 60s however from the 70s there was a couple of major operators p o had a ferry route for a while as indeed did pentland and northlink but in the 70s there was a change of player uh, caledonia mcbrain also joined in the 70s it was previously mcbrain it, uh, it was not a newcomer it was the old one relaunched renamed uh, but from 2006, they changed their name again from Caledonia McBrain to Calmac. And that is how we know them today. So the Scottish Government is ultimately at the top of this pyramid of power. And it realised at some point there was going to be a need, a requirement if you will, to replace the existing ferry fleet. The uh, Scottish Government accepted Calmac's reasonable recognition that the ferry fleet needed to continue its ferry update programme and to provide more ferry capacity, all quite reasonably, but how it was done is where it all went wrong. These videos explain why, where and how much. Some of these ferries were getting quite old of course, some of them were due to no longer being fit for purpose due to the changing business models or routes becoming far more busy and some were becoming more uneconomical to repair. And so the decision was made that they needed to start replacing them and of course this was during the days of the first SNP government. The SNP at the beginning actually had a majority government, they had an absolute majority in government and they could do more or less what they could. And of course this isn't the Hamza Yousaf government, it isn't even his predecessor Nicola Sturgeon. This is back in the days of Alex Salmond as the first minister. And of course they set up a few committees because nobody ever makes this decision on their own. You have the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. This was chaired by Edward Morton, MSP, late of the Blues and Royals. He was a highly educated man and an excellent committee chairman. And it oversaw such things as farming, rural affairs, fish farming, even in the locks, 
and things like that. And of course, it is involved in the transport links to the rural communities that are on the islands. Uh, there is now a net zero and transport committee, and this had the oversight on whether things were economically viable in terms of environmental issues, looking at the environmental cost for things and checking that everything was clean. Although obviously nothing is clean, nothing is truly clean. But at least if you can get to a point where you can make it as clean as is reasonably possible, that's what they were there to do. And so you have these two committees and we all know that committees are filled with people who are not necessarily experts in the field. And this was certainly the case. In fact, no one from the highest echelons of government all the way down to these committees at this point were in any way expert or knowledgeable in shipbuilding or ship running or even the designs of ships or even knowing what the requirements of these ships were to be. And they, CalMac, CMAL, Transport Scotland and the Scottish Government didn't think, of course, to bring in an expert. And we will be looking at that in another episode. So anyway, they have done their consultations and their huddling and they're doing their deals and they're doing their arguments for and against. And they, CalMac and CMAL, eventually arrive at a proposal, a statement of technical requirements. And they say, right, this is it. We want these ferries built. And so Caledonia Maritime Assets Limited and CalMac are separate companies, but wholly owned by the Scottish Government as sole shareholders. This is a private company. Uh, it's known as CMAL. It's a private company, but its shareholders are the relevant ministers in the government. And although it is a private limited company, it acts as an official arm of the Scottish Government. In effect, they are public service companies, similar to, say, Network Rail. But Re Network Rail defines itself as such and knows it is subject to the relevant legislation and has a clear code of conduct. Such arrangements are far less visible for both CalMac and CMAL. So there we are. We're down to four or five layers of bureaucracy and government control. The Scottish Government to Transport Scotland to CalMac to CMAL. And since the government uh, nationalised Ferguson's, to Ferguson's. And still no one knows enough about what they're talking about to deliver anything. But CMAL, the Scottish Government said, yes, okay, we need to have these ferries done. We need to run these routes. So CMAL put them officially out for tender and although Caledonia McBrain or CalMac as they changed their name to who are the existing owners of that franchise to do the work they're obviously the ones with the preferentials they got the job and they are designated the operating authority for Scottish ferries they tasked CMAL as their designated procurement authority they were tasked to replace their aging ferries now CalMac are a ship operator a ferry operator uh, CMAL does not build ships nor do they. The Scottish Government steered the ownership of Ferguson's into Clyde Blower's company, which is owned by Jim McColl, and so they went to Ferguson Marine. They are the last shipbuilders on the Clyde, and they went bankrupt in 2014, which is how Jim McColl acquired it for about £600,000. They were nationalised, and after they had exhausted all the contract money and more for 801 and 802, and it was a way of maintaining at least some shipbuilding within Scotland. Uh, but they went to Ferguson Marine because they wanted the fact that these ships were made in Scotland, but it always required huge taxpayer support. This was pushed, of course, by the Scottish government. And they had to be built in Scotland, as opposed to, say, South Korea or Turkey or anywhere else that does shipbuilding. Uh, it was a matter of pride. And so Ferguson Marine were tasked with building these ships. Of course, Ferguson Marine are shipbuilders, they're not ship architects, and so they outsource the design stage, the architecture and design, to a firm called Holder, who are maritime and naval architects, and they do this for a living. This is where they're supposedly the experts, and I'm sure they are. As an interesting aside, Holder were the architects who designed the ship that eventually became known as the Sir David Attenborough. This was a research vessel that was going to be going down into the Southern Oceans and into the Arctic and doing some very serious sort of ecological work and researching, uh, especially for the deep marine areas. It's a very worthy project and a very nice ship as ships go, I'm sure. But you will probably know this ship much better because of the original name the ship was due to have. And there was a competition where they asked the public to name the ship. And the winning name, of course, was Boaty McBoatface. 
And so that, I'm afraid, draws to a close the organisations that we'll be dealing with through the course of these videos. But you can see a direct line running from the SNP government through Transport Scotland, the committees through CalMac, as to the body defining the service use, CMAL into CalMac into CMAL again, Fergus and Marine into Holder, and finally Fergus and Marine back from Holder once they've got the designs. It is important to note that Holder's involvement was short and limited to procreating a single concept design in answer to CMAL's statement of requirements. And having done so, their services were dispensed and they play no further part in any of this. As I say, there's a lot of areas where there are a lot of people that can make mistakes between the various stakeholders in this process. But that gives you an idea of what was happening, of who was responsible for what. And so now we'll just very quickly look at a couple of faces around this section. Uh, these aren't all the faces, they're just a few of the important ones that will come up over the course of the next few episodes, so we'll do the faces now. So here we have, in no particular order, Kevin Hobbs of CMAL, Robbie Drummond, he of CalMac, Jim Anderson, also of CMAL, and Kevin Gibson, who is an MSP. These names will come up in later episodes, particularly Kevin Hobbs and Jim Anderson. So they are the organisations and some of the people involved. You've got that brief outline of what is going to happen. Uh, and so far, everything is kind of plain sailing, you think. But obviously, it's slightly over complex in terms of structure. But the finance of it do need to be explained. Uh, the principle would be that there'd be uh, a voted loan. Uh, and this would be, say, lending money from the public purse to buy these ferries. Uh, so the money was voted on on the floor of the house and this money was given to CMAL uh, so that they could order the ferries from Ferguson Marine. Uh, and Ferguson Marine would use some of that money to complete the designs, uh, the designs that they paid for, uh, and then to use some of the funding for the building uh, and the production drawing and, of course, then the finally uh, the, the construction of the ferries. Uh, in broad terms, that is a fairly normal process. Uh, so why and where did it all go so spectacularly wrong? Uh, that we will, of course, explore. Uh, it is also essential to, uh, to say that all the events beginning with uh, CMAL's creation of the st uh, Statement of Technical uh, Requirements uh, took place in the SNP's own sort of inward-looking bubble. Uh, this is detached uh, and it operated well away from like the real world. It's so much like the SNP uh, and sort of the normal outlooks where people know what to do. They know what they're doing. Um, they know how to get things done successfully. Um, they're realistic. They're pragmatic. Uh, but what followed, um, you know, this is a description of events in a dream world um, where, where no other engineering or procurement organisation operates like this uh, because it would be guaranteed to fail like so much of what the SNP do. Every private engineering project in Scotland can be assumed to be under sound professional and financial management, but it's never this the case with the SNP. Uh, so then what would happen is CMAL was then technically left with this huge debt because Ferguson's could not build a ship within the contracted price. Uh, but that debt wasn't to the Scottish Government, that debt was to, to CMAL. Uh, and then the voted loan, though, was then to be repaid out of the charter fees pay, uh, CalMac would pay to CMAL to run this ferry. Uh, it, that would then feed back into the public purse and pay back that voted loan uh, over time. That's, that is the theory. But, of course, the build cost exploded. It was out of control. Uh, and the ships are not in service and they're therefore they're not earning any money. Uh, and anyway, that's the theory. But of course, like anything involved with the Scottish Government, in particular with finances, uh, nothing is as clear as it seems. And we will look at that in a later episode. Uh, so basically, we come to the end of this episode. Uh, I said it'd be about 10 minutes. It'd be longer. It's going to be near about I think 13 minutes or so. But I think we've got there. We've got the rough basis and the shape of everything that was supposed to happen. Uh, but as you can see, with the complexities, you can see the areas where there's likely to be problems, uh, you know, things like that, where there's likely to be miscommunications. Uh, but that draws to a conclusion the first part of this, what I think will be a six-part series. Uh, and so I hope you'll join me in the second part when we start to look at some of the particular problems. Uh, so thank you for watching. 
and we will see you in the next episode. Goodbye.